Hello, it's Scott Manley here with the uh, Galileo Conquest Part 5 and this magnificent beast. Well, this is the final iteration of the Jim Project. After much testing of the re-entry vehicle project, Jim is intended to send a spacecraft to the surface of the moon and return it. And of course, when I say the moon, I actually mean the moon called Iota, which is in orbit around the planet Gale, not around the planet Kerb. And this is always very confusing for me, but it is a moon. I, it's just not the moon with an umlaut and all that. Anyway, yeah, this is the biggest thing I've built so far in this game. Those external boosters get us up to speed, up to about 500 meters per second. They jet cleanly to descend, uh, rather to crash back into each other. And the core stage is using one of those LVT-45 liquid fuel rockets with gimballing and all that. It doesn't get huge acceleration at this point, but it is already going high enough, fast enough and sideways enough that it can continue its rise into orbit safely. Now the bosses have specified that I need to land in three different biomes and since I'm landing I want to get that fancy materials data and I want to return to Kerbin with it. That's why this vehicle is designed the way it is. I'd like to imagine that it bears some sort of sneaky resemblance to its namesake, Father Jim Johnson of Rugged Island, but uh, no, it's just a big rocket that I'm sending around the moon. Using all these tricks that you've seen like a million times before, it, it is kind of dull, I guess. I guess the only interesting thing here is that uh, this is probably the first time I've sent something using these science containers. The science container is what's going to return the contents of the materials bay back to Gale. We have four materials bays around the edge. We hope to at least get a couple of them from surface biomes of Iota. Uh, we also obviously can get high altitude and low altitude data from Iota. And really the question is, how much fuel do I have? How much biome hopping will I be able to do? Because I actually don't really have a biome map yet. We're still working to investigate, to learn about this solar system, this strange place, which I've never really played through before. The only indication that I do have for biomes is this science here and now feature, which is going to tell me when I cross into different biomes. So what I'll do, well, other than stopping for a moment to admire the gorgeous, beautiful sunset brought to us by the various visual overhaul mods, which I've installed using the help of Seacan. Yes, I always have time to pause for a sunset. Well, until I time accelerate through it. Okay, and we're coming around for a sunrise. Now we're ready to make that burn. Line up. We're just going to burn along the... Although we have the maneuver node pointed along one particular axis, I just tend to burn along the uh, prograde vector since it feels that I'm not going to be losing any... Uh, you're not going to be getting any cosine losses. All we're really doing is using this burn to push us up to the altitude required. We'll actually make the correction burn. The one where we have to be accurate is the second burn. I think, you know, we're close enough, 7.5 meters per second. So yeah, we just have a, a slightly inclined orbit here due to my inability to launch things along the equator precisely because the uh, launch site is not on the equator. Yeah, you're always going to have to be making these out-of-plane corrections unless you line up your launch with the ascending or descending node of Iota. But yeah, quickly enough, 64 meters per second and a nice view from all the way up here. Look at that beautiful planet down below us. The planet which is strangely homelike and yet strangely unfamiliar to someone that is used to gazing upon the beautiful sights of Kerbin or... Earth, wherever that is. Of course, these kind of maneuvers are really peculiar to, uh, well, me, basically. In the real world, when they were doing the Apollo lunar missions, they didn't need these kind of out-of-play maneuvers because they picked their launch window much more accurately. They had to pick it so that they would enter around the moon. And because they were constrained by that, because they didn't have the fuel that was necessary to perform a plane correction like that on the way to the moon, they uh, were very limited in the inclinations that they would encounter the moon at, which further meant 
that they were highly limited in their launch and landing sites. There's a great video out there which explains how the landing sites were chosen. Also for landing on the moon, they wanted the sun to be at a specific range of angles so that the surface would be illuminated perfectly. But there we go, I get to choose a polar orbit because I like polar orbits. You know that it will ultimately pass over every region. And so I begin my landing. And wouldn't you know who it is? It's old me! Okay, now, on descent, we're gonna wait until we're below, like, about two kilometers, because we don't want to burn too early. Burning too early will just waste fuel that we could use for transfers to other sites. Uh, uh-oh. Turn a little faster. I can see surface features for 1,300, 1,400... Oh, dear! I'm going down too fast. I may have actually messed this up. I'm getting just over 1G of acceleration, but this has a very limited amount of fuel. This is an extra stage, which we're using for bonus fuel. That's the best kind of fuel. There it goes. It will meet the surface at quite a rate, and I will successfully slow down. Oh, look at it! It's a bit flying off. Amazing! Okay, now I'm just gonna land this thing very, very gently. We still have that big engine on it because I haven't got the technology for the smaller engines. So, just the tiniest bit of thrust to slow me down. Six, five, four, three, two, stop! And don't fall over. It's not full at falling over! Excellent! And so now, the first landing on the surface of Iota in the Highlands. Yep, it's still cold. Collect and recorded atmospheric pressure data from a vacuous world. The seismometer hibernates. What? The seismometer hibernates? That doesn't make any sense. Materials. Loosely attached materials bounce slightly as the doors open. So now we have collected all that important data, it's time to start uh, transferring some of the stuff. Well, we're going to store the uh, materials data in the experimental science storage pod thing. So how do we do this? We got a... Review... No, that's... We're going to transmit that first. This kind of ground must be excellent for shock absorption. It's a mattress. We've landed on a mattress. That's what they're really saying. Collection recorded atmospheric pressure data. We'll transmit that. And... Oh, damn, we're out of power. And something just exploded. But of course you don't need to sit me and watch me do all that because it takes a really long time with that little solar panel powering everything. Now our brave probe has finally uh, transmitted all its data. Its electric charge is currently a little low, but that doesn't deter it. Time for it to move on to a new nesting site. Yes, this is the migration of the famous Jim probe. Jim is known to spend only a limited time in one region until it is drunk dry of all of its science. I have no idea what direction I really need to go, so I just kind of turned sideways and hoped that that would bring me out over something at some point. So science here and now is showing that I'm over the highlands, but in anticipation of finding a new and more promising science spot, I, I orient in the retrograde attitude. We're going to basically hop over as soon as we see something, we're going to throttle up to 100% and arrest the motion and basically fall gently to the surface, whereupon we will pick it clean. I don't even know all the different uh, biomes that are on these planets. Highlands, 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 and Iota's range. Well, you know what? I'm going to make my range to the range zero, so that at close range we can examine the range with our range of scientific instruments. And I'm sure while we're there we can arrange for a range of range readings from the range. This is actually a pretty rare thing that happens quite a lot in Kerbal Space Program. Basically, landing at one spot in a body and then taking off and landing on another one. In, in uh, missions to other celestial bodies, it doesn't happen in reality. In Kerbal Space Program, you need to do it because the biomes are so large that driving between them in a rover is just not worth it. But I guess in reality, it has happened for the near-Earth asteroid rendezvous, but that was never meant to land in the first place. Also, I guess... Technically, a uh, file from Rosetta, it landed more than once. Anyway, we're just gonna wait for this to happen at the right moment. This is always so tense, you know. I remember my first landings in Kerbal Space Program, I messed them up, they were so hard. And now it's just super, super easy. 
I just got all the skills. I mean, it does help that you have an SAS mode, which works with a you know retrograde. That is a godsend in terms of uh, automation, making landing a whole lot easier than it once was. You know, in the old days, you couldn't turn while SAS was on. That was how bad it was. Anyway, terminal, uh, terminal velocity arresting thing, also known as landing. Three, two, or three meters, uh, two meters, one meters per second, and touchdown! Touchdown of Jim. Drink, drink, drink from the science that is here. More atmospheric that doesn't matter. Seismic scan, something registers. And materials, surface dust gets in the Science Junior and causes it to mal... Drink! Don't worry, soon I will run out of probe names and have to go to some other obscure British comedy. Okay, so we don't need to bore you with the, any more of the experiments. We're going to move on to the new location having transmitted everything. So again, we're just going to travel laterally across the surface of Iota and hope that we find something worth scanning. And I've no idea how far that will be. Again, we're just going to wait for science here and now to inform me that I am in a new and fertile region. Fertile with science, not obviously fertile with crops, because nobody's going to be growing anything on Iota until I send my greenhouses and colonies and things like that. So in the top right, you can actually see that I've visited two of the five biomes. And unfortunately, I'm, uh, well, I'm getting a little higher, so what I'm starting to do is circularize my trajectory to carry me further around. I don't know exactly how far I have to go, but I add a little bit of uh, velocity here, pushing my speed up by about 50 meters per second. At this point, I'm starting to get worried because I don't know how far I need to go. And I don't want to find that I run out of velocity before I run out of fuel, if that makes any sense at all. 250. Now we're starting to fall back down. The velocity is decreasing. We're still, we're over the highlands again. And we're starting to get rather low, I think. Time to think about adjusting my vertical position here. So I'm just firing my thruster upwards. And that puts me into an actually a low orbit here. And... Oh man, yeah, now we're on the strip! I've got to say, this is nothing like the strip in Las Vegas. I feel very uh, short-changed on this. Okay, let's uh, start killing our lateral velocity. We've got to get this down. Hopefully, I have enough Delta V to put this whole spacecraft to the surface. Still have fuel left, 60, 50... <gasps> oh no! 40 meters per second left! Damn it! Damn it! Oh man. Okay, well, let's just grab the science that I can from these. Uh, we we're going to detach that. I kept near space science inside. Uh, I kept one of those material bays with the science in it, so it was easy enough to transfer the fuel out of it. And off we go. We're now starting to accelerate back up to orbital speed. We shall leave the booster stage behind, but we shall not get the achievement that we wanted. Also, we will not get to visit Iota Strip, which is no doubt exactly like the Strip in Las Vegas, which is full of casinos and uh, volcanoes and dancing fountains and pirate ships and limousines full of people that are far too drunk. And uh, You know, if you go to Las Vegas, yeah, it's the weirdest place in the world. It's like Disneyland, except that it's not. Also, if you go, don't ever gamble on any of their games. If you're going to gamble, only ever gamble when the odds are in your favour. Then it's not gambling, it's investing. Anyway, there was no gambling here. I could have risked a landing by transferring fuel, but I would prefer to get my science back. I can always send more missions. Well, it turns out, though, that we did actually succeed in landing something. If only I had a probe body attached, I would have actually got the, the relevant achievement or whatever for the contract. But it looks like I'm going to have to send another one. Yeah, the experiments and everything all survived. I wonder if it's worth setting these, uh, you know, collecting these at some later date for recycling. Oh, look, little fuel tanks and everything. Merrily falling, rolling down the hill, gambling across the surface. Like, gambling like sheep gamble in the fields, not gambling like someone at a blackjack table. Or like a ball at a roulette wheel. I'm kind of surprised that no one in Las Vegas has decided to make, like, a giant roulette wheel and put people inside those Zorb balls and have the people bounce around. I mean, 
that would be surely the most Vegas adult attraction ever. Anyway, speaking of attractions, we now need to escape IOTA. We're actually rotating, we're orbiting in, op, well, retrograde. Usually we, I would be orbiting in the same direction as the rotation of IOTA. And strictly speaking, that's not what the Apollo missions did. The Apollo missions, actually, they were all going retrograde. But the rotation of the moon is so slow that it didn't really matter which way they went. What did matter that they, was that they were forced onto a retrograde orbit just simply by their free return trajectory. Of course, this is more like the Soviet Luna missions, which were the Soviet attempts to get samples from the surface of the moon after their uh, giant N1 rocket basically became a, a big explosive device. Uh, and it, uh, you know, they didn't park in lunar orbit after recovering the stuff. The upper stage literally flew straight back to Earth in one go. Of course, they only returned about 100 grams in each mission as opposed to like 20 kilos in Apollo 11. But anyway, we are returning with materials data. We're not returning with surface samples because we can't do that in, well, with any of these mods as far as I know. Now the moment of truth. Can Jim keep himself steady and stable as he hits the atmosphere? Well, I tell you what, he's going to put on a blazing fireworks show here. I, I always love watching these re-entries when bits start to break up. I find it... It's such a shame that the physics don't really work properly at distance. Also, I think, you know, the designers of Kerbal Space Program made one mistake with the thermal system. I think that thermal failure, the first thing that should fail at like 95% heat, should be all the joints. So the part should just break off. And then if it reaches like 100% or 110%, then it should actually break. But I like the idea of things just simply breaking up because they're uh, overheating. Then you get these nice things falling apart into thousands of pieces in the sky. Looks far more spectacular if you ask me. Of course, now I've mentioned it, maybe some modder will go out and create a... Uh, <laughs> will create something that dynamically adjusts the joint strengths based upon t part temperature. That would be more correct, I guess. That as things get very hot, they have a chance to suffer from thermal failure or things start to bend a little more. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, I've never seen uh, like a mod which makes parts or joints that bend too far not spring all the way back. You know how you, you can have proper springy bends and you can have bends that don't go all the way back and I'm sure there's an engineering term for it that has completely escaped me at this time. That would be a cool thing. Anyway, what would be a cool thing is the nice cool ocean of this planet. Ah, yes. Bring me back. Bring all the science back. What do we know now? And the results are in. And this has been an epically successful science mission. We have 679 science. We have 1.5 million funds. Whoa. We are going to be able to start spending that on some serious upgrades to our base. And we've barely got to the nearest body in our system. There is going to be so much that we can do with this. First up, let's get those bigger rockets and those smaller rockets. Uh, command modules, we're going to get some simple, smaller, lighter weight command modules that should help with landing on the moon. Story, you see, we have... I'm not... The question is really, what don't I want? Since I have to get everything in one layer first. That's my rule. I'm not skipping ahead. Aerodynamics. Um, uh, oh, grid fins. Oh, yes, I can start making waffles. A subsonic fly. Advanced construction with some blue recycler type things. I have no idea what that is. Looks like a very simple part. Construction workshops. Uh, I guess I should probably start learning how to use all this at some point. Miniaturization. Oh yeah, we definitely should get the docking stuff since that's a core technology that I actually understand. Unlike all this other stuff here, all this construction and colonization. Landing gear, I can understand that. Okay, so I've managed to avoid buying anything that I don't understand and we can uh, go into the future episodes without not knowing things. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.